And I will now pass the uh, pass the mic over to Mia for her presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Sina Lisa, and thank you uh, to the Sutra Library for inviting me to come today. Um, I'm super excited and nervous, but overall excited to be here and so honored to share a bit about Polynesian genealogy, something that is my life's work. And I hope that those who are watching here and those who will be watching in the future will find some answers to the questions that they have in trying to connect to their Polynesian ancestors. So with that, just a brief overview of what today's presentation will look like. So I will first give um, a little bit of a context to what Oceanians or Polynesians in general, how they view their oral, uh, how they view their genealogies. And then we'll go into how to research your Polynesian genealogy um, with some specific tips that will guide you and help you to understand where to look and how to look to connect to your ancestors. And then I will also provide some genealogy resources and along with that too, showing you how to record your own history because that's part of genealogy as well, right? We're not just looking to our ancestors, but we're also thinking and keeping in mind that one day we will become ancestors. And so what should we do about that? So with that, let's go right into the perspectives. Um, but first, real quick, I want to go over a little bit about vocabulary and geography. So in the Pacific, which is the largest ocean on the earth, it's split up into three regions. So Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. Today, I'm focusing on Polynesia, though I need to acknowledge that the Pacific Ocean is vast and has a huge diversity of groups of people. So we should keep in mind that um, some of these things that you'll learn today, the methodology and even some of the cultural aspects of our people, they connect to Melanesia and Micronesia too, though they do have a little dif a few differences. And so again, just to emphasize today, we're talking about Polynesia, but the indigenous term for the ocean and the people of the ocean is Moana, which is really fitting, right? For the Disney movie Moana, because Moana in Oceania means ocean. And I love that my people view the ocean not as an obstacle, but our ocean connected us to one another. Um, instead of thinking, oh, I come from islands of the sea, my ancestors used to think we are a sea of islands. And so I just think that's so beautiful. And I just want to share that with y'all. Um, lastly, in academia, the term Oceania is used as an umbrella term to cover Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia. So just keep that in mind for today's presentation and future reference. So let's jump right into some genealogical perspectives of Polynesia. What does that look like? For Polynesians, genealogy is literally everywhere. In this background picture here, it's a picture of the stars in the heavens. And those stars had names. They were literally guiding stars for people to travel across the ocean, but those names were given to the, to the stars in the heavens um, as names from people's ancestors. So our genealogy existed in everything around us from even the plants that we named or that were um, growing from the earth beneath us to even the tides in the ocean, to the types of coral reef, the fish, I mean, you name it, it's, it, everything is connected to us. And so our genealogy literally exists beyond just humans, but to all of nature from things above us and things below us. Another great perspective to keep in mind um, in Polynesia, we have this really interesting concept of time and space that is a little different from how we view time and space in Western culture. So I love this Hawaiian saying here that I wanted to share. It says, ikava ma mua, ikava ma hope, which means we look to the past to guide our future. What does that mean? So in Western culture, we think about leaving the past behind and moving into the future, right? And looking towards the future and planning ahead for it. Whereas in Hawaii, as well as other Polynesian groups of people, they saw the past as in front of them and the future behind them. So if you think of like 
many of you, I'm sure you're historians or researchers, we can see a clearer picture of what happened in the past because it happened, right? So we have libraries, we have books, we have so many resources that tell us this is what happened to your ancestors or this is what happened years ago to the people and to the community. Whereas the future, I don't know about you, but I can't see the future <laughs> as much as I try to. Um, I try to plan for it, but the future is constantly shifting and we don't know what's ha what's going to happen essentially. So if you can't see something clearly or understand what's happening, wouldn't that be behind you? So when we're looking to the past, we're looking in front of us to our ancestors. They're the ones who can see what's behind us. They're the ones who can guide us and give us the information that we need to prepare for what the future is happening. And as the future is manifesting itself, it comes in front of us to become the past. And so that's how Pacific, uh, that's how Polynesians looked at time and space. So what does that mean for the present? It means that all of us are the living embodiment of our ancestors in the present form. So my first full name is Miyamoto. I'm named after my great, 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 great grandmother on my Japanese side. And because I'm named after her, who she was, I am. And who I am, she is. And everybody else in between us, those who came before us and those who are still coming after us, we are all connected and I am all of them and they are all of me. So every time I think of that, it, it gives me so much hope and strength for, um, for my life and for my future. And I hope that maybe this shift in understanding time and space can help you too in your life. Another perspective of Oceania is mythology. So I know a lot of times we think mythology is fake or made up stories, but in Polynesia, mythology was a way of storytelling actual events that were happening. So for example, I know, again, referencing the movie Moana, there's a demigod Maui, and Maui is known to lasso the sun and pull it and make it stop from going so fast um, through the sky because the people couldn't sleep, they couldn't rest. Can you imagine our days and nights being super short because the sun just whipped through? So Maui listened to the people and lassoed the sun and pulled it with all his mind strength and slowed it down. And, you know, that's a cute story, but if we were to take it just at surface level, we would miss some of the deeper meaning and truths behind it. So in Tongan culture, the sun is representative of a chief and so, or an honored ancestor. So the, if we're looking at it at that Tongan symbolism, the story of Demi, the demigod Maui is of an honored ancestor who worked or who listened to his people to stop um, a ruler from overworking them, from not giving them time to rest or spend time with their family. And so that honored ancestor Maui, uh, whether through warfare or some kind of wrestling here, made that chief stop overworking the people. And so because he stopped overworking the people, it's as if day existed again, whereas day was 24 seven in the past. And so, because they never had rest. So that, that if we if we just look at mythology at surface level, we miss some of these gems and symbolism of the people. Another again of this of the demigod Maui, he was in Hawaii. There's a story of him on a canoe out in the ocean with his brothers, and he has this magical fish hook he throws in the ocean, and he tells his brothers to keep paddling and don't look back as Maui's pulling what they think is a giant fish. And they keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And then out of curiosity, one brother looked back and saw that Maui wasn't fishing for a fish. It was, he was pulling up a whole island. And so that island came up because of Maui. And I mean, I haven't seen someone pull up a, an island with the magical fish hook yet. Maybe that will happen, I don't know. But this story describes how that island was formed. And so, Again, we can't dismiss the mythology, especially as we look deeper behind the symbolism um, 
behind these stories. They have so much truth behind them. Another aspect of genealogy in Polynesia is the nature of our names. You know, names um, denote where we come from or who we belong to or what group and community we um, associate ourselves with. And so this is a picture of some of my ancestors and their names have been passed down in our families because we want to remember who our ancestors were, who had those names, just like my first name, right? And so names have that power behind them and not just a label to say, oh, that's Mia right there. They also have stories behind them. I know family members that have long Hawaiian names, but those names literally describe the events around their birth or around the time their family was maybe escaping a dangerous um, circumstance or they were um, moving on to find a, a different life for themselves. And so look at the nature of names in your family and don't just, again, don't just take it at surface level. There's usually context behind why a person has the name that they have. And so I would invite you all to think more deeply about the nature of names in your own family, as well as in the community that you belong to. Along with that, the structure of the family is so unique and different in Polynesia compared to Western culture. Um, and I have this chart right here to explain uh, the perspective of families in Hawaiian culture. So ego is represented as me or you. And if you look in um, this horizontal line, the same line that I belong to as ego, they have these yellow circles and green triangles and each of them say kaikuana, kai, kaikuane, meaning brother or sister, or meaning in, sorry, again, in this, this line right here, this would represent my first cousins because if you go up from ego, makua hine, makua kane is mom and dad. Mom and dad have siblings and then those siblings have their own children. And so in Western culture, those children on the same line as me would be considered my first cousins. But in Hawaiian culture, there's no word for cousin. It's that's my brother or my sister. And I was born and raised in Hawaii and I have Hawaiian ancestry. So I was very fortunate to grow up around um, a lot of cousins. And I look at those cousins to this day as my siblings. That's how close we are. And I just think it's so beautiful to think that that same generation that you belong to, that kinship you can have and that love that you can feel from one another is evident of what our ancestors saw as family. We're all brothers and sisters. And going up a generation to parents, my mom's sister would be considered my mom. And my dad's brother would be considered my dad. So I have a bunch of dads and moms. And it just, to me, it provides like this very loving and village-like mentality that our ancestors had and that I think we're lacking a lot of community nowadays. But this is how family was viewed back in the day. And how were our genealogies shared? How were they portrayed amongst the Polynesian people? Well, there's several ways that people and cultures did this. One being in ritualistic dances and chants, Samoa, even Friday night dancing is a way of portraying your genealogy and showing your family history. And hula as well. And I want to um, put a little spotlight here on hula because Mary Monarch Festival just happened in Hawaii. If you haven't watched it before, I highly recommend you do. It is the greatest celebration of hula and hula culture in the world that happens every year on Hilo Hawaii Island. And um, the best of the best dancers and performers showcase hula and they compete against one another. But what I love about hula and the body movement is that body holds a lot better at memory than we think, um, especially in the society where we believe in just writing things down or um, even recording it like this, uh, that's fine. But a muscle memory is something that Polynesians knew very well and they trusted in and believed in. And so that, that goes to show too, when um, 
you and maybe you're part of the diaspora like me, if you're trying to connect to your ancestors or to your culture, move your body. If you can, move your body in a way that will help you to remember. So that can that can be through dance, that can be through chanting, that can be through learning the language. And I want to emphasize too, it's not just your, if you are a descendant of Polynesia and you're trying to learn the language, you're not learning the language, you are remembering the language. You're remembering the language and the tongues of your ancestors. And so let that muscle memory from generations of DNA that's embedded in you come to life through movement of your body. You'll be so surprised how much you remember. Also too, I wanna to put an emphasis on tattoos. That is also a way that genealogy has been portrayed um, in Polynesia. Okay, so what are the functions of genealogies in Polynesia? Well, there's a lot of reasons why genealogy matters so much and still matters a lot to Polynesians because it has so much attached to it. Whereas in Western culture, um, I wouldn't say it's it's necessarily like this today. You know, can you imagine your genealogy determine what land you could live on or how the land is organized? So territorial organization, land ownership, inheritance, marriage regulation, social strata and control, political representation, feud support, ritual observance, religious beliefs and norms, intertribal relationships, trade and commerce and warfare. Like that's a lot, right? And so that's why genealogy mattered so much to Polynesians in ancient days and still matters a lot to us now because again, there's so much attached to this. So much attached to it. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to think about who my ancestors are or, you know, something that's very light. This is serious stuff. And so there's, this is this is also the reason why uh, genealogies can be very guarded amongst the people and amongst the keepers of genealogies. Because if someone were to take my genealogy and manipulate it so that they say in court, oh, this belongs to me actually, their genealogy is wrong. Those disputes happen today and families lose land all the time because of this kind of stuff. So there's a lot, again, point, here is there's a lot attached to genealogies and that can be very beautiful for our people. So now that you've heard a lot of the context behind genealogies of Polynesia, what they look like, what they, what the flavor of them are like and how you can access them through body memory, muscle memory and so on, Let's dive into the methodology or the practice of how to do your own genealogy research. So again, I wanna emphasize that this is being recorded. So if I'm going a little fast, just know that you can always watch this again later. I don't want you to be stressed out. Um, I just want you to enjoy and learn as much as you can from this, okay? So take a deep breath with me and let's move on. Okay, so the first step I love telling people when it comes to Polynesian genealogy is you need to keep a record of your research. I know this can be, this can be tedious. Um, as a genealogy undergrad, that was one thing I did not like doing was documenting my work, but it helps to reduce duplicative work, meaning that it prevents you from doing the same searches over and over again and wasting your time. If you have a record of what you've been doing or what you've done, that can prevent you from doing the same thing over and over again. And it can also be a source for others to look at your work and build off of it. Say you pass away and you have all this documentation of the work you've done. This can be such a blessing for them. So one of the places I love to document my work is through Google. So Google Drive, um, I create a bunch of spreadsheets and even docs. It's for You can sign up for free as well. So this is just a plugin that you can literally do this on your phone. You can do this on a computer, a laptop. It's really simple. So take the time to figure out 
where am I going to put all my stuff? What's one place I can keep it and keep it safe? And for me right now, that is through Google. But what does, um, what does this look like? What can we, um, what kind of items should I keep track of? So I have this little screenshot here of a research log or research calendar that I was keeping of some of the ancestors I was researching. And you don't have to be as detailed as I am in the work I do, but I highly recommend that there are a few things you definitely keep record of. So keep tabs on where you research. So that can be um, a website, that can be a book you looked at or a microfilm, but keep track of where you looked and then keep track too of what you researched. It's important to put down like, oh, I was looking for this birth certificate when I researched on family search. And then also include your source citations. It's so good to know where your sources are, where they're from, and be able to put down their ID numbers if they have any. You can also keep track of the URLs, but I would warn that URLs change all the time. So links break often. But when you have an image number, the line number, the microfilm number, that stuff normally does not change in a source. So keep track of those things. I've also put down, keep track of your images. I download images all the time in my research. So make sure you keep track of those things too. You can number them. Again, you can save and upload them into Google Photos in a saved folder on your drive. Keep track of those things. And then also keep track of the results of your search. You can show that, oh yeah, I looked here and I searched in this collection for my ancestor, but nothing came up when I typed in their name in these search boxes and keep track of those results. Again, so you can know that, okay, at this date and time, I researched here, there was nothing on my ancestor at this time, but I searched again a year later in the same search and it turns out this repository uploaded more of the collection or digitized more of the images. And so now I have a lot more that I can look at and I actually found my ancestor. So keep track of those things. And then lastly, keep track of what you're gonna look for next. You know, as, as a result of your search, what are you, what is the next step? Where are you gonna go next? Those things will help you so much. Again, I know it can be tedious, but Trust me, it will be worth it in saving your time and saving time from others who will build off of your work. The next thing I would highly recommend that you create research objectives. So this is making a constructive list of the things you want to learn or discover about your family. And the more specific you are, the better your search will be and the better um, your work will be. So for example, I have some really good objectives right here. These are very nice and specific and let's read them. So the first one saying, prove the relationship between Iva Manini Talo Papa and Falinga Tiapula. Iva was born in German Samoa around 1914. Falinga was born in American Samoa, but her birth date is unknown. See, I'm, I clearly list out here what I'm looking for between these two people. I want to know what the relationship is and I want to prove it through records. And this is what I know so far about them. The second one, again, being very specific, I want to find this kind of record, a birth record of Emma Mako Pio Pio and then her children. Then the last one, I want to better understand what family search is and the tools available to help me in my genealogy work. So again, it's very specific. You can't really like mess around with these because you are so specific in what you're looking for. Whereas if you look at the bad objectives, these are very broad. There's no really like guidance on helping you to figure out where you want to go. So the first one, do family history research or any research. Um, what is that? <laughs> and just do family history research, which family you want to look up? What history are you trying to understand? And any research, okay, any research can be for anything, you know, so it leaves all these open questions and that can really stress you out if you don't have guidance. So that can become a, a lot more specific and be changed into a good objective. And then that second one, to find my ancestors, again, 
you descend, if you do ancestral math, I should have put an ancestral math picture here, but if you do ancestral math, you descend from a, a millennia of people, right? So everybody that you're connected to that has passed away is your ancestor. Which, which person are you gonna start with? So th does that make sense that you need to be specific? The more specific, the better, and the more you can focus in your research because it's very easy to like go all over the place. And I would say too, when you start recording your work, it's okay to have multiple objectives, but focus on one objective at a time. And you can always divvy out your time to, I'm gonna focus, today is Monday, I'm gonna focus on this objective. Next week, I'll focus on this objective. So just be methodical in how you create these objectives and how you research them. The next tip being start with yourself. So after you've decided where you're gonna record your work, what you wanna research, start with you. Start with you and take the time to identify what you already know because you will be very surprised at how much you already do know. And once you pull those things out of your brain, record them, write it down, write it down, write it down. So, that's, sorry, this picture is not loading. Um, that's okay, we'll keep rolling. So for an example, I have this objective here to find a birth record of Emma Makao Pio Pio and her children. Starting with me, this is what I know about Grandma Emma. She's my mom's mom's father's mother. So my great great grandmother, she is native Hawaiian. She was a school teacher in Kahuku on Oahu Island. She came from a prominent family downtown in Honolulu loved God, and everyone in the family looked up to her. That's what I remember, okay? Again, this is what I knew before I started researching Grandma Emma and looking into her life. So I wrote this stuff down, and this is a good place to start. Because again, I could have been like, I know nothing about her, but actually when I sit down and think about it, I'm like, oh, I'm thinking about all those times that I sat at the feet of my tutu and heard her tell stories about Grandma Emma. I'm thinking about my mom or others who were recalling their experiences with Grandma Emma and pulling those out and writing them down here. So again, you know so much more than you know. Take the time to think about it and then write down those things that are rel relative to your objective. Number four, talk to your family. This is family history, so you need to talk to your family if you can. And I put if possible because I have worked with a lot of people who also don't have connection to their families, whether they have stopped connecting with them or just don't because maybe because of adoption or things like that. Um, if you can, talk to your family members and find out as much as you can about your ancestors. Remember your objective because it can be very easy to sidetrack. I don't know about you, when I talk to my family, when I start talking to them about one thing, it leads to this whole journey of talking about everybody else. <laughs> so um, remember your objective, try to stick to it as you talk to your family members. And if you want and have permission to document the conversations you have, you can document it through writing things down and saving it in your Google, draw, uh, your Google Drive. You can also do it through audio recordings or videos or any other way that you can think of. Talk to the family. Sorry, I don't know why that picture is not loading. It's just of my great grandma, a great great grandma, Emma. But again, from the top here, I have the objective and I've said, okay, remember, we're looking for her birth record and of those of her children. So after talking to my family, this is what I found out. Grandma Emma was married to this man named Samuel Kamwana Kalama II. Okay, so if I'm thinking of Grandma Emma getting married to Grandpa Sam, she most likely took on his name. So her maiden name is Mako Pio Pio, but her married name is Kalama. So I need to keep that in mind as I'm looking through records because her names, her last names could have changed throughout the records. Um, they had six children. Their names were Velma, Melvin, so Melvin is my great-grandfather, who was born in 1917, 
then Samuel III, Alexander, Vernon, and Gladys. So those are the kids. And um, when I asked about the birth records, because that's what I'm looking for, um, nobody knew where the birth certificates were for Emma or her kids. And I highlighted here. So that meant that I would have to look them up myself. So you see how much I saved, how much time I saved by talking to the family? Um, you can gather so much from them about anything and everything you need to for the family, but talking to them because most likely they actually knew who these people were when they were alive. And I wasn't around to meet Grandma Emma, but my mom and some of her siblings and the older cousins from her generation knew who Grandma Emma was. So talk to the family if you can. The next tip, number five, learn the history. You cannot do family history well if you don't know the history, period. So again, if you can't, you cannot do family history well if you don't know the history. Family history, history, right? So you're going to go on some cool history uh, trips here in learning your family history. It's pretty fun, in my opinion. So again, with my Grandma Emma example, I, I'm looking for her birth records and or her birth record and those of her children. So from talking to my family, the starting point is that Melvin was born in 1917 in Hawaii. That's my great grandfather. So if we think about generational gaps, that usually, I know a lot of people just say 20 year gap between children and our parents and children and so on and so forth. But I like to expand it a bit because sometimes it captures a little bit more because not everybody was having kids at only 20 years old, right? So the range is between 20 and 30 here for me. And so because of that, the estimated time range of Emma's birth, if we're going off to 20 years since Melvin was born or 30 years, that range of Emma's birth date is between 1887 and 1897. And that begs the question down here in the context of history. So what was happening in Hawaii between 1887 and 1897? If you know Hawaii history, you know that in 1893, on January 17th, the legal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom happened. So this history provides context to the family history of my family and of my people. What does that timeline look like then? So the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom happened in 1893. Then from 1894 to 1898, Hawaii became a republic. In 1898, Hawaii was annexed by the United States, and then two years later, Hawaii was officially made into a territory of the United States. Then, 59 years later, Hawaii was Hawaii became the 50th state of the United States. So, again, this context gives me an idea of what was happening at the time Grandma Emma was born, um, and the context of her children what they might have been experiencing as a family, as a community, and of course, as the people of Hawaii, what everybody was going through. And this is at, you can say this is at a macro level of history, but understanding that macro level helps you understand the micro level of this family's history. It also helps you to understand the choices that they made. Uh, why did they stay where they stayed? Or why did they move? Why did they immigrate? Um, why did some children die or, you know, why did, why did the father die? Like, there's just so many different questions that come up that maybe you wouldn't have asked if you didn't know the history. So knowing the history will help you to better understand the family's history. And with that too, that will also help you to understand the laws of the land. So the laws determine who made the records where the records are kept, how they were documented, and what information is there. So going, still carry on with my Grandma Emma example, like I shared the history there in Hawaii at the time that maybe when she was born and of when her children were born, Hawaii was going through a lot of turmoil. The indigenous people there were going through a lot of heartache with losing their kingdom, 
and um, being forced, illegally forced to become a territory and eventually a state of the United States. So now that we understand the jurisdiction of who owned the land or who was in charge or ruled the land at that time, we know where the records are or what kind of records existed during that time. So going off of, again, our objective to find birth records of Grandma Emma, we know, like I said, the jurisdiction of those records most likely was in the United States or at least mimicked or is of the United States. So what kind of genealogical records existed for the United States at that time period? What, what can I expect? You know, is it wild to think that I want a birth record for Grandma Emma at that time that maybe she was born? Did they exist? I don't know, but it's good to look at the type of records and kind of like fill out maybe what existed. So I have a short list here of the kinds of records that maybe were around when Grandma Emma was born. So the census records, which are taken every 10 years and they're kind of a snapshot of families or households um, in neighborhoods and districts and counties in the United States. And they're taken for tax purposes. There's court records as well that document cases that come through, all kinds of cases that come to court. There's also a type of court record, which is probate, which is to pr prove in the court the authenticity of a last will and testament of someone who has died. And through probate, the decedent, so the person who passed away, their real and personal property is either divvied up through the last will and testament so probate records are really important to look at too. And then vitals, birth, deaths, and marriages. These are records that document the vital or the most important event of a person's life, birth, death, and marriage. So after you know looking into this, I realized, okay, I can keep looking for birth records possibly. Like I'm not gonna keep that, I'm not gonna shut it out because Hawaii became a state in 1959 when there's a possibility that maybe these vital records existed at the time she was born, or maybe they were created a, a lot later when she was an adult so that she can create a birth record of her life. So yeah, if you don't like law, sorry, you're gonna have to learn. <laughs> it's It can be really fun, I promise. So maybe look at it in perspective of you being this really cool investigator. So learning history and the law will help you with your family history, I promise. And I should also note too that cultural laws should be respected and understood too in doing Polynesian research. So my example has been mainly focused on Hawaii research and we know Hawaii was um, taken over by the United States. So we know where US records are, but you should also understand too that culture has their own laws too. And there's some areas in Polynesia like Samoa that still honor culture and culture is the law of the land. So learn the cultural laws too, because they're just as important. Um, like knowing who the leaders are of the village or who the keepers of the oral genealogies are, they are the ones who keep the records, they preserve them. And just like archivists, just like librarians, they are special leaders and pillars of preservation in our society. So learn who they are because, because of the law, they exist. So also learn those things too. It's, it, it, it's also really great to know. Next is to research the records, number seven. So here is a, few, a short list of a few notable data, databases and resources I recommend when researching Polynesian records. Uh, you can screenshot this, but again, just know that this is being recorded so you can always look at it later. So Family Search, I put Family Search at the top because it is a free repository. Um, they have millions, I think billions of records now, and you can access it all for free. It's run by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but you don't have to be a member of the church to have a free account. It's available for everybody. So if you don't have it, I highly recommend you get it because it's nice to save money, right? 
Next is Ancestry. They are a paid subscription. I love Ancestry too. They have great records there and resources for trees, um, for sharing and even DNA we know about. Um, but yeah, if you want to pay for a subscription or even access through your local library, I know a lot of libraries have Ancestry accounts that patrons can come in and use. So take a look at that as well. National Archives at respective locations. So I know New Zealand has their own archives. So I have Archives New Zealand there. Australia, there's so many places that and nations that have National Archives. Take a look at where they are and see what kind of records they have there and how you can look them up. University of Hawaii is also a great resource. Um, Hawaii Nui Aokea specifically is the um, Hawaii Research Center. And during the pandemic, they were um, every Thursday, I believe, via Zoom, they were bringing in all these professionals throughout Polynesia and the Pacific to teach about genealogy or the history of their people. And so they have these recordings available online. You can look at their website. I love looking through their talks. There's always so many great things to learn. The Pacific Manuscripts Bureau is an institution that collects manuscripts throughout the entire Pacific, digitizes them and makes it available for people to look at for free online. So again, I would also look at, at their repository. It's massive, but also a great place to research. Archives New Zealand, um, I put here because at my last job, I was doing a lot of research there. They are a wonderful national archive for Aotearoa or New Zealand. And they have a lot of great Maori records there um, that are also available for the public to look at. And you can go in person if you're from New Zealand or know people from there. I highly recommend checking it out. And then lastly, do not forget the local libraries from universities. So shout out to Sutro Library, right? Um, check out the universities, check out the state libraries. Um, there's libraries on islands throughout Polynesia too and in villages. Take a look there because you'd be surprised what they have that other places don't. So don't forget the libraries. And here's some steps when you're looking through your records. This is some of the things you should do, okay? So the first being know what records you want to look at. So you know how I was saying, I wanna look for birth records because I created that in my objective. I know very clearly that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for birth records, but if I can't find birth records, what other kind of records can I supplement that'll help me to prove the birth date or the relationships of Emma to her children as well as to her own parents? Um, the next thing, know what you're looking for. So again, your objective should point you to these things of what kind of record you would like to look for, and then specifically what in those records you want to find. And if you're unsure, like I know a lot of people are, so don't sweat it if you're feeling this way. If you are unsure what records to look for, look up research guides from repositories and archives and libraries because they produce so many great guides to tell you how to research these kinds of records. And um, when you look at those guides too, they will have, they can have links to them. They can have specific time periods and such great information. So look for those research guides. And I would recommend even just Googling a research guide. That can be, if you don't know the repository you wanna find, just Google it. And that can be the best way to find things sometimes. And then when you're looking through records, it's good to look through um, based off of location base and then names and then dates. And I'm gonna show you an example of how to do that. So first though, I wanna tell you about research guides at FamilySearch Wiki. So when you get your free FamilySearch account, you click after logging in, you click on the search tab and go down to the research wiki. So the research wiki is like a Wikipedia compiled through Family Search for you to do genealogy research. So after you click on search and research wiki, you come, this page, this landing page will line, uh, show up and you can type in the place or the topic you would like to learn more about in genealogy. And when that happens, I typed in Hawaii here and I screen recorded this video. This is the page that popped up. It has all 
has guided research here, all these different record types that you can look at and learn more about. So if you wanna find something about cemeteries, you can click on it. It takes you to another page and will show you records related to cemeteries in Hawaii, as well as all these other record types. Gives you this beautiful map here, gives you background of Hawaii, cultural groups to consider when you're doing Hawaii research and lists of archives and libraries, societies, and even some local family history centers. So don't sleep on the research guides. They have so much to offer and someone's done all the work for you already. So I would highly recommend signing up if you can for a family search account and looking through their wiki and any other library and association and archive, they have great resources all readily available for you. And you know how I mentioned Googling, I was, for this presentation, I was thinking that maybe we should Google a record type. And I was like, okay, maybe we should Google how about you censuses. And when I did that, this is what popped up. This research guide here from Hawaii Manoa Library, which shows that for census records, there are these kinds of censuses that existed in Hawaii. So it has a breakdown of Hawaii Kingdom here, censuses that were from 1840 up to 1896 before Hawaii was illegally overthrown. And then uh, territory of Hawaii census records here too, and they have links for you. So again, don't underestimate Googling, don't underestimate how powerful um, this can be for your research. And I just wanna show you real quick how to do a search on family search. And I hope this can help. So, okay. So this is my family search account. When I click on search here, I'm gonna go to records. Again, this is being recorded. So if you can't write everything down, it's okay. So one of the first ways you can do research is in a very broad or general sense. And you can do a general ser search of records here. So if I were to type in Grandma Emma's name here, and I would just to type in Hawaii as well. This would search through every record at Family Search, which is a lot, and try to match to Emma, Maka, Pio Pio, and Hawaii. Okay. So our results, that's for some of us, that may not be a big number, but for me, if I'm trying to save time here and be methodical in my research, that is a lot of people and records to look through. I would like to save you some time by showing you how to be a little bit more methodical in your record search, okay? So I, I could go through every single one of these and verify, oh, that's not Emma, that's not Emma, but that would be a lot of work. I don't want you to work harder than you have to, right? Work smarter, not harder. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take you to the wiki again the Family Search Wiki. There we go. So it loads to this page here. And I'm going to search. Oh, sorry. Going back to records, my bad. We're going to go here and scroll down the page. You can type in a location here. This is a locality search. And I typed in Hawaii, and it takes you to this landing page here. It'll tell you that you can do that first search that I did here, Grandma Emma and her last name, and it'll search all the records in Hawaii like I just did. But there's also specific collections you can search through, which I highly recommend. So looking through locality, which we just did, we pulled up this landing page, and then looking through specific collections, because that'll save you a lot more time and a lot more energy. So let's just pull up a collection here, the Hawaii births and christenings. And when I pulled it up, it shows me a little bit about, or tells me a little bit about this collection. You can click here to learn more about how to research here, but I'm just gonna type in, just for the sake of it, Grandma Emma's maiden name and click search within this collection. And once you look at that, 11 results, that is a lot easier than 98, right? So very excited about that. and this will help me to discern a lot quicker who Grandma Emma is. Is this the Grandma Emma that I'm looking for? 
Now, when you find a hit like this, for an example, I'm just going to open this one. It'll take you to this page here that has this beautiful index. Indexes are done and created by people or volunteers here at Family Search who look at an image and type out what they see so that this becomes searchable for you. And so this is the index. And this is great, but I recommend you go the next step, which is to look at an image. So unfortunately, this search result right here has images on a film that are not attached to grandma, that Emma that we just looked up. But for example, this would be an image that you find um, if you're doing this research. And this is the index that would pop up down below. I always tell people to look at both the image and the index to verify that what is being indexed here is correct on the image. Because sometimes we're humans, we make mistakes, and the volunteers that do this work too are also imperfect people. So sometimes there's typos. So looking at an image can help you verify that what the index is saying is correct or not correct. So again, just as a quick overview, look, you can do a general search, but I would recommend do a locality search and then collection search. And when you find a search result, as you're looking through them, look at the index and the images. Those five things will help you in your research. And we cannot talk about the Pacific Islands or Polynesia specifically without acknowledging oral genealogies in our history and our culture. Like I mentioned, oral genealogy requires, requires muscle memory. And when you have muscle memory, that can be passed down for generations because it's embedded in our DNA. And so I love this saying I once heard that uh, my ancestors knew that the ocean and the winds and the waves, they can wipe out an island. They can destroy mountains. They can um, break down material like fales or houses right here, but the mind and the soul will never die. Waves can't destroy that for our people. And that's how we kept our oral traditions and culture alive is through that muscle memory. So Family Search has a wonderful genealogy collection there. It's one of the largest collections of, uh, sorry, I should have changed that here, but it's one of the largest collections of oral genealogies for Pacific Islanders. And you can look at it for free on Family Search. And I recommend looking by locality or ancestor's name. And so I'm gonna do another demonstration on how to find those genealogies. It's a little easier to demonstrate versus trying to make slides for it. So I hope this is helpful for all of you. So when we open our Family Search account, to find the oral genealogies, click on search again, and then go down to this button here that says genealogies. So we click here and it pulls up this landing page. Then you will scroll down down to where it says oral genealogies here. Click on view all trees in this collection. I recommend this rather than just searching by person because you, the search feature is to, in my opinion, needs to be tweaked a little better so that you can search a lot easier. But for now, this is how you get here. So there's 1 million, 1.3 million genealogies or records of genealogies you can search through. That's a lot, but how, how I recommend you search here is through locality to narrow down what oral genealogies exist. If you don't have a name of an ancestor or if you're just curious to look, I recommend locality first. So I'm gonna type in Samoa as an example, and this will filter out the oral genealogies that are associated or tagged in Samoa. That's both Samoa, Samoa, like Western Samoa and American Samoa, okay? So I have about 1.2 thousand uh, results here or 1,200 results. And 
this is what this tells you. So it tells you the tree name and a little bit of information about who the interviewee was, the interview date, the place, interviewer's name, and then the language as well as the audio under what collection, how many people were listed in that oral genealogy, and when this oral genealogy was last updated. So this is highlighted pink because I just, I looked at it before doing the presentation. So I'm gonna click on this one and it will pull up this page here. You can do a search. If you recognize like, oh, I know this person or this is my ancestor, or I have a specific name to search for under this specific oral genealogy by this person at this time in this place, if you have that information already and you know what you're looking for and that specific, that's great. But most of us don't have that. So this is what I would recommend. You open up an oral genealogy that you think, oh, I think this is related to my family somehow. It'll take you to this page. Then you can click on search. Trust me, okay? And then it'll pull up this huge page of search results of the 76 people in this oral genealogy. And you can click on any one of these and it'll take you to all the same place that we're gonna look at right now. So I clicked on that top result. And when you open an oral genealogy, they here in this section is a produced family tree based off of the oral genealogy given, okay? And on the side here, on that specific person that I clicked on in the search results, this tells us a little bit about who they are. So their name, their, their sex, their birth, their death, and then people who they're connected to in this tree here. And then there's that citation and source right here for your research guide. So make sure you copy and paste this too. But the, the jewels of this whole oral genealogy is right here. Clicking on the show, show more detail. So when you click here, it opens up these files that have the literal oral history recording, recordings, they have two in this um, oral genealogy, their PDF, the lineage, and the English translation of the oral genealogy. So for fun, I just clicked on it and it pulls me up to this audio. Family History Library, Digital Convert, Pai to Valley of Tonai. So it's that you can actually hear the person giving the oral genealogy. And I've had many people who have looked through this and found recordings of people that they've never met, but they're related to, like my friend's great-grandfather and his grandfather, who he never thought he would hear their voices again, but they found them here in the oral genealogy. So if you can, come take a look. You'd be surprised what you could possibly find. Um, again, looking at this, if you click the Samoan PDF link, it'll open up a PDF file of the transcription of the oral genealogy. So what's highlighted here in this blue box is that oral genealogy that you were just looking at. So here's the transcription right here. And what's highlighted are the names that are listed throughout the oral genealogy. Isn't that amazing? So this is the Samoan. PDF, and then this is the English translation right here. So for those who don't know someone yet, that will yet, like me, you can look at the English translation and understand what is being said in the genealogy. I just get so excited every time I show people this. And so what you can do too, if you have a family search account and you have a family tree, you can tag this oral genealogy to them by searching for their name or their ID number and then tagging it to your ancestor in your tree. So that can be saved and you can even download this transcription and print it as well. I mean, come on, this is pretty awesome, right? So take a, take a chance and look at these oral genealogies. They're beautiful and they're so fun and amazing to look at. So I hope that helps some of you to um, maybe find your ancestors in these collections. And we are wrapping up here. So thank you for holding on. We are, we're close to the end. I'm just going to wrap it up with a few more things. So some other notable genealogical resources for your Polynesian genealogy research. I want to highlight these 
these few ones. So I love maps. I don't know about you. I love maps. And this resource here I really enjoy is called Native Land. They're a digital map of indigenous lands. And this is their URL right here. Um, this is a crowdsourced source. So, um, you know, you can take it as it is or do your other kinds of research. But I took this screenshot here specifically of um, New Zealand and Australia because I feel like they've done a really good job at mapping out the territorial places of the, the indigenous people and the boundaries. And if you click on the specific name of that land or that land boundary, it takes you to another landing page where it can have like Wikipedia pages or maybe the tribes or the villages website. There's so many great resources attached to this. And so I would highly recommend taking a look at this website to better understand the native land of people around the world. It's not as full as I wish it was for um, other Polynesian places or Melanesian and Micronesia places too. But I, I still thought I would share it just in case you are a map geek like me. And so this is one great place to look. Another, um, I've had a lot of people ask me about DNA and I'll be the first to tell you, I am not, uh, I do not feel confident yet in presenting or talking about Polynesian DNA, but I have a great friend that is, and his name is Kalani Bondoy and he has this amazing blog, hawaiiandna.wordpress.com. And I forgot to put this in the slides. He also has a Facebook group called Polynesian DNA. So if you want to connect with him, you can look on his blog or you can look at his Facebook group where he is so great about posting all these things that he's learning or using to help unravel Polynesian DNA. Because as I've gone through my DNA journey and trying to understand what my DNA is telling me and how to connect it to genealogy, um, he has been such a guiding star for me. So I would point you all here at this resource because there's not enough resources yet or more resources that um, can help us do Polynesian genealogy with our DNA. But this is a great place to start. So please go check out Kalani's page. And lastly, to help end the presentation here, my eighth tip for you in your Polynesian methodology is you need to record your own history. Be a good ancestor now by documenting your life. All of us are gonna be ancestors one day. All of us are going to, so in other words, we're all gonna pass away, but how are you documenting or recording your life so that people who will look towards you, your posterity, your future nieces and nephews, people in your community and the nation and the world, when they're looking at you and you know, how are they gonna know about you? They can know about you through others, but it's always better if you tell them yourself, right? So take time to record your own history. And one of the ways I love doing that, documenting oral genealogies and history is through StoryCorps. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they are a phenomenal, phenomenal company that um, was created to help all of us record oral histories of ourselves and of each other. So StoryCorps is free, has a free app, and they also have a website where you can learn more about it. But essentially you can download the app, I think on Android and on iOS, on your Apple devices, and it'll provide prompts for you to ask questions and has a space for you to record your oral history. and when you save it there, you can also have the option to save it um, or upload it to their website so that others can hear the oral history. And you can also save the recording in the Library of Congress here in the United States. So I love StoryCorps. I think they're a phenomenal company. Give them a shot. And if you want record through audio, it's a great opportunity for people to hear, not just read about you, but to hear about you from you. Other forms of documenting include, you know, a lot of people talk about journaling. I love journaling. So write things down, journal your life. You can also take pictures, film videos. I have friends who write poetry to record their lives or make music or dancing. That's supposed to be dancing. Hopefully you get it. But 
they love to do those things and document themselves that way. And it's a way of not just preserving themselves for the future, but even just as a release from everyday life. So I would hope that as you are doing genealogy research, um, I don't want you to get frustrated, but a lot of times a lot of us do because we can't find records or documentation of our family as easily in Polynesia as many other Western cultures or Eurocentric places. And so don't be that person. Don't be that ancestor who could have documented their life or done things to help so that future generations who are going to research you or do genealogy on you aren't frustrated or mad that you didn't write that down. <laughs> so I'm not trying to shame you, but please, please consider recording your, your life. And to end it all, there's no point in doing genealogy, in my opinion, if and looking at the past, if you don't remember to how your living embodiment of the present is going to impact the future. So please choose to be a good ancestor now. Um, this is a picture of my great grandmother right here, Martha and her husband, Grandpa Mel. Um, they were such good people in our community in Hawaii. They were good to our family, good to everybody that they came in contact with. And because of that, I feel so blessed today. I'm living off of their blessings because of the conscious choices they made to be healthy, to live good lives, to be kind. Um, they're religious people. And I, I'm also associated in religion too because of them. And they honored and loved education. And I do too now. So I honor them and honor their names because they chose to be good ancestors when they were still alive. And I'm forever blessed because of them. So all in all, do the best you can to be a good ancestor. And I promise that you will be helping those who you don't even know yet. And they'll be so grateful for you. Mahalo. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. I hope that this helped some of you in ways and maybe gave you some answers to questions that you have. And with that, I... We'll turn the time back over. Is it to Stina Lisa? If anybody has questions, but overall, thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mia, for your talk. That was so engaging and informative and inspiring. Uh, I, I so appreciate you uh, sharing all of your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>